And he's told me, he says, Steve, I know that the Vatican is playing us. And he said he's playing a lot, they're playing a lot of our politicians as well. He said, and there's some of us here, and he's in the Mossad, he said, there's some of us here in the Mossad that know that. And he said, but it's going to take the Messiah. And he believes Jesus to be the Messiah, by the way. He said, it's going to take his return to get this turned around. I said, but you know, the thing is, I said, you guys are going to have to break that covenant. So I said, somebody's got to wake up. And I told him, I said, Michael, I believe that the only way you're going to do it is it's going to, I said, we're going to get hit hard. And he doesn't agree with me on that. But I told him, I said, we're fixing to get defeated in a battle in Israel. I said, and that's what's going to, that's what's going to cause our people to cry out to God. We're going to be defeated. And when we get defeated, then you'll wake up. So, I, I, you know what, brother, I think this is a good direction for us to go in, too, maybe tonight, is to talk about, and, and especially with, with, with the gift that you have in understanding uh, the Illuminati, the, the Jesuit order, and how this works around Israel, let's go into that. Absolutely, Stephen, absolutely, yeah. Are you cheating? You got your Bible before I got mine. <laughs> Man drew his sword on me. <laughs> I want to tell you something here. Um, okay. It's very, very important, actually, regarding Israel and the end times. But I'm turning to it right now. Just bear with me. Go right ahead. You know, a scripture I brought out the other day to people was in Ezekiel 36. Verse 5, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen, or the nations, um, and against Edomia, which is Edom, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast out for a prey. That is clearly Rome coming in. They appoint the land for themselves, this is where I believe that the battle of what most people would be, consider the battle of Psalm 83 comes into play. This is where Israel takes its first defeat and, um, and it's what will drive Israel to their knees because they come in. They'll look like, basically, Brother Allen, they're going to look like uh, saviors coming in. Rome yeah. will look like a savior because they bring in a force, they bring in NATO troops, the NATO coalition, to push back the Muslims, and yet they're the ones that brought the Muslims in against it. They're the ones that incited the violence in the first place. I mean, look at, look at, I mean, for God's sake, Pope Francis sits there, smooches uh, Mahmoud Abbas, you know, and, and I have sit there and showed people picture after picture after picture. He's in bed with every single Arabic leader in that region, all the way from from uh, from the King King Abdullah of Jordan uh, to the, the 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 leaders of Lebanon and uh, even the leaders of Iran send to have a diplomat now appointed to Rome, uh, and, and and as well as. And of course, if people don't believe that the Pope controls everything, then why then does uh, uh, does uh, the, the 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 president of Syria last year he sends the Pope of Rome the conditions that he would surrender under? If you're going to surrender, you're not fi are you fighting the Pope of Rome or who are you fighting? Why do you send that? Why do you send your conditions of surrender to the Pope unless the Pope's running the show? Well, I'll ask yourself a question, Stephen. Why do the ambassadors of the nations? send their ambassadors to Rome. Why do uh, the president of the European Union, Hermann Rombri, why does he go to Rome? Why does the chairman of the European Commission, a Vatican Knight of Malta, why does he go to Rome? Why does Joe Biden, Jesuit trained, from St. Joseph's and Santa Clara Jesuit University, why does Obama, from Notre Dame, why does he go to Rome? Why? Exactly. And they all bow. They all kiss his ring. All the women that go, the wives, if you, if, I don't know if ever, anybody ever notices this, but you know this yourself, Brother Alan. Any woman that goes in the presence of the Pope must wear a black dress and must be veiled. Yeah. You know, the, the, the world just does not realize the seriousness of, of what's going on and, and what the plan is. 
You know, it's, it's just like this, when we were talking about the other day about the ten regions of the world, and, and we see the conflicts that are going on, and, and uh, you know, Chancellor, uh, the German Chancellor, uh, Angela is going to, to Putin, and, and France's uh, Prime Minister is going to Putin. You know, everybody, I mean, the world is sitting there playing the game and thinks that this is all a big thing and wondering if we're going to have a nuclear war in the world and stuff like that. But they're just, they're just plan, plotting and planning, putting things together to redraw the boundary lines. The West says to Putin, you know, you can't redraw the boundary lines. The West already knows that the boundaries of the lines have got to be redrawn because the Vatican is the ones that's redrawn the ten nations, or the ten can I share regions. Some, can I share something, Stephen? Sure, Sorry. sure. It's, it's from the book of Zechariah, chapter 14. Okay. And it's verse 2. This is a very shocking scripture. Go right ahead, anytime you're ready. It's very shocking. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. This is God. Yes. Saying that he will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. And the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled, and the ruling ravished, and half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then we go to verse 12. And this shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that are fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. I'll put the Bible down, but what I want to share is that in regards to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, people don't want to receive this revelation, but the nations of the earth will be gathered against Jerusalem, Stephen. They'll yes. be gathered against Jerusalem. And the Lord himself will come to the Mount of Olives and he will send out a plague by the brightness of his coming. He will consume millions upon millions in the valley of Megiddo, in the valley of Armageddon. There will be millions of people destroyed by the power of the Lord. You know? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly right. That's one of the reasons why I keep saying that. People don't realize Israel's not going to win the battle in the beginning. No. You know, and Al, Brother Alan, when you look at the, the, the ministry of the two witnesses, in light of that particular scripture there in Zechariah 14, when would you put their time on earth in light of that particular scripture? Three and a half years into it, midway. Okay, now, is, in other words, is their ministry before this event or after the event? Midway, three and a half years into the tribulation. Okay, so this, the event is halfway into the in, in there. No, look, okay. as soon as the abomination of desolation is put in the third Hebrew temple, in the holy place, at that moment I do believe that Moses and Elijah will come. Right, and that's at the halfway point is what you're talking about there. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. And, and I can I can understand that and because the thing is the showdown's got to be between the Antichrist and between because God just like He did when God said that He was pouring out His wrath in Egypt He says to Moses I have come down to deliver my people and then He says and I'm sending you but God says Himself that I have come down and God says I will pour out my wrath and I will pour out all of my judgments upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt Stephen. Let's make this a long video. Let's really, let's both of us pour our hearts over here. Let's really make this a long video. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I believe, Stephen, right, that we need to make a long video here. We need to really pour our hearts over here. And what I believe is this, Stephen. I believe that the two witnesses will come to Israel when the times of the Gentiles come to an end. I agree with that 100%. And Stephen, they will only come to an end. This is what I believe. You can test this. You have to test everything that I say by the word of God. 
I believe that the two witnesses will come to the land of Israel, Moses and Elijah. They will come to the land of Israel during the end of the time of the Gentiles. Now the time of the Gentiles will only come to an end when the abomination of desolation is set up in the holy place. And I want to say something about Jesuitism here. I think it's very important. Yes. You have Jesuitism teaching, uh, futurism. You have a lot of teaching today that the Antichrist will only be one man in the future. Okay? But that's not right. Every pope of Rome has been an Antichrist. That's exactly right. Yeah? So you have this deception being taste in the Church of God today over the last few decades. And the truth is this. There will be the final Antichrist, but every pope has been an Antichrist. But what you find is that when people talk about the third Hebrew temple, you have two extremes. You have the extreme that talk about, you know, the Antichrist will only be one man in the future, in that sense. Or you have the other extreme that teach that there will be no third Hebrew temple. Do you understand? Yes. Yeah. I believe there will be a third Hebrew temple, according to Matthew chapter 24, where the Lord spoke about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. And he said, whoever reads, let him understand. Bringing us back to Daniel, uh, chapter 9, verse 27, where the Lord said that the oblation and sacrifice will cease. And so, therefore, there will be a third Hebrew temple. There will be. That's exactly right. But at the same time, Stephen, the Vatican and the Jesuits have brought in this doctrine into the church that we cannot know the Antichrist until the final one in the future. You see? And it's not true, though. That's, that's the thing. It, but like you said... What people don't realize, and, and I'm, I know you're aware, aware of this as much as I am on this, is that all your leading evangelists, and, and I personally say that the ones that you see going back to Rome and joining with the Vatican are how you know which ones are the Jesuits. Now, I make that statement. I know that a lot of people don't like it when I said John Hagee has gone back to Rome, but he's apologized to Rome. Now, is he a Jesuit or was he threatened to lose everything, and he kind of went back through coercion. Uh, I, with his case, I might think it might be coercion. But nonetheless, you take Kenneth Copeland, you take uh, um, Rick Warren, all of these men, and many others like them, all you have to do is look at what they're preaching to know that they're Jesuits. They were planted, they were made famous, they intentionally got the publicity, because why? The Jesuit order knew that, for example, they know all the different doctrines that are out there. They know, they know there's a big group of people that want to be Baptist. There's a big group of people that like Pentecostal. And I'm not saying that, that, that I'm not picking on the denominational systems that the people are in, but they know that. They've watched the system, just like Satan watches you when you're born as a child and studies you your entire life. They know what people like. And so, therefore, they took and raised up these different men and these different groups sent them to their colleges, their universities studied, became well known, and then they made sure they became famous so that when it was time to come back to join the mother, uh, the mother whore of Rome, they would be able to bring the flocks in in droves. And therefore, the only ones that would come out of the system would be just a little bitty remnant here and there. And yeah. And I know the scripture in, in Revelation 18.4 where it says, Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her plagues. One, that shows that God's going to bring his two witnesses to bring the plagues upon them. And secondly, uh, and, and I realize that that can be, that can, scripture can apply to the Gentiles as well coming out of her. But specifically, I think God is talking to Israel because he says, Come out of her, my people. And the problem is, is Israel, of all people that know better, Israel has joined into Rome. Mm. Stephen, all nations have. They're oh, yes. Under the, they're under the power of the temporal power of the Pope. The Pope is a monarch. He rules over all governments. One thing I'd like to say about the false prophets in regard to what you were saying before, Stephen, is that 
for instance, it takes a lot of years for Jesuit trend. I'm going to be careful what I say here. I'm going to say it very carefully. It takes a lot of years for Jesuit trend, false prophets. These are not false prophets who are in deception about the Bible. I'm talking about men and women who are what's called conscious conspirators. They are deliberately bringing out false doctrine. That's important to understand. They are not men and women who are deceived in the Bible. There are men and women who twist the word of God. And what they do is deliberately bring into the body of Christ false doctrine for the purpose of dumbing them down, for the purpose of deceiving them. And it takes many, many years for these false prophets like Rick Joyner, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, uh, Joel Osteen, Rick Joyner, uh, Rick Warren, and there's many, many others, of course, it takes many, many years for these men and women to receive millions of followers. And they don't say nothing about the Vatican. Only until they have millions of followers. And then they come out and expose themselves as agents of Rome, coadjutors. They align themselves with Pope Francis and they praise the Pope of Rome. And what that does is it brings all of the followers into the Church of Rome. That's the way it works. Same with Billy Graham. He's done exactly the same thing, Stephen. He preached the gospel. He was a Protestant. He preached the gospel. He preached the true gospel for many, many years. And then what did he do at the end of his days? He praised the Pope. As the greatest evangelist that's ever lived. So what you have here, same with Catherine Coleman, same with Benny Hinn. I call him Benny Sin. <laughs> you know? Do you know he sent me uh, a friend request? Benny Hinn himself sent me a friend request on Facebook. Really? I denied it. Good on you. <laughs> but anyway, my point is this. I'll, I'll, I'll finish my point and I'll pass it on to you. My point is this. That all of these tele-evangelists like Rick Joyner, Patricia King, uh, Benny Hinn, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, you know, all of them really. Just the Plantis, Jerry Saval. I mean, God, I could give you such a list. But the point is this they're all Jesuit trained. They're all Jesuit coordinators. They're all trained by the Vatican. And what they do is they infiltrate the body of Christ. And they're bringing millions of followers. And then ultimately what they do is expose themselves as Catholics, as Jesuits, supporting the Pope. And what that does is it brings all of the followers into the Church of Rome. That's the agenda. That's it. That's exactly right. That's exactly what they're doing. And, and you know, the whole thing is, is when we go back and we look in the Scripture, we, we clearly see... You know, when Satan got lifted up, he wanted to be like God. And I've looked back at this many times. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshipped as if he were God. And when you look at that and then you see the way things are playing out in the end time, it is obvious that what Satan intends to do, he's trying to mimic the very ministry that Jesus Christ had. That's exactly what he wants, is he wants his shot at it as well. And I, and I really believe that even though Satan knows what's written in the Word of God, he is hoping, he is hoping that he still has a chance. Though it be slim, he believes he has a chance that he might defeat God and that he might win this battle. Because all he has to do, especially in light of the fact that uh, Jesus makes the comment, all that the Father has given me will come to me. Not one of them will be left out. So he may not know who all of them are, but he's going to do everything he can to make sure that any person he can, that he can get to fall and take to hell with him, he's going to take to hell with him. But in, in, in light of that, though, we see he's going to get a three and a half year run at it for himself. Yeah. We see that he's going to, he, the, re, the only reason he's building, helping Israel to build this third temple 
It's because he wants to do like Jesus did. He wants to come preach in it. And when it comes time for him to stop the sacrifice and oblation, he can do it just like he did on Mount Zion when they got when they give him that seat over there. He just snaps his fingers and the Israel, Israeli uh, military jumps to his command and they go in there and throw the, the praying Jewish people, they throw their own people out. I mean, it reminded me, Brother Allen, of Nazi Germany when we had is, is Jewish people as, as German police to police the Jews. All for what? What did they get in return? They got a little extra bread. They got a little bit something more out of it. But Stephen, let me challenge you here, man. Do you not think there's really company? Are there? Well, that's the, that's the point. That's exactly the point. It is let's the Israeli about, government doing it. Let's, let's talk about that then. Okay. Okay. Let's the, expose the Jesuits. Exactly. Because they're crawling all into the Israeli government. Yeah. Now, Shimon Peres, he was trained by the Jesuits in Poland. It's exactly right. Exactly. And you take any 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 politician that goes to Rome out of Israel, if he's not a Jesuit, he's already he's definitely collapsed to the Vatican already. So that puts Benjamin Netanyahu in the same category. As much as I always loved him, when I seen him go to Rome, to me that's it. What do you do? When you go to Rome, you have sold out. The thing is, I'm not trying to interrupt you in a rude way because I know you. I know Stephen that you know this. They're high in essence. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right, and because of, of, of when I first brought that out, what I just said there about. Netanyahu going to Rome and, and, and then uh, I was threatened from people in Israel, Israeli government. Really? You know, because I made that comment. And but, there, but I say that at the same time though, there are people in the Israeli government that are not on the Mason side, they're not on the Jesuit side because we it has to be some or if, if they're not there yet, they will be there for the simple reason is, is we see that they're going to break the covenant. So somebody in the government's got to break that covenant. But unfortunately, we got enough bad eggs. It's just like uh, Moshe Faglin. I don't know if Moshe Faglin, what side he's on, but I did, I did watch him get railroaded in this whole process. He was part of the Likud party, but when they went to go to count the votes, Netanyahu call, calls a judge in the middle of the night and says we're not going to have any, he, he pressures him not to have anyone there to uh, monitor the counting of the vote. For what purpose, I don't really know what, but he made sure that that happened. And then what happens when the next morning when Fagelin comes in, there were no monitors, and suddenly Netanyahu wins by a landslide, but nobody has any idea for sure if the votes were counted properly. And, and I sent a message to him, to Fagelin, and I told him, I said, you've just been railroaded is all. Because why? You must have a decent heart in you, and you must really maybe love the Lord, but, they, but you're not playing ball with them. And, and, and the sad thing is true as well, we've got a lot of rabbis, and I really question whether or not the Temple Institute is not part of the conspiracy with Rome in building this third temple. Can I share something with you, Stephen? Sure. Regarding the Temple Mount. Do you know who really rules the Temple Mount? It's, it's, not the Dome of the Rock. it's not the Dome of the Rock. It's not King Abdullah. No, it's the Pope of Rome. No, it's not. No, I didn't it's know that. It's the Knights of the Equestrian Order. I did not know that. Oh, yes. I the, Knights of the, Equestrian, the Knights of the Equestrian Order, they rule the Temple Mount. They always have done, Stephen. Always have done since the foundation of Israel. They've always been there. Can you elaborate on that? The Holy Sepulchre. The Knights of the Equestrian Order. You know what they rule also? They rule the banking system. In Israel? They're untouchable. Untou no, no, worldwide. They're okay. untouchable. They're the highest Vatican Knighthood. They're above the Knights of Malta. They're right. above the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. They're above them. The Equestrian Order, <laughs> they rule the Temple Mount, men like King Abdullah II, they are Jesuit trained, Jesuit trained, Jesuit trained, Jesuit trained, but they don't have power 
over Israel, the Vatican knighthood that rules Israel is the equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre. They rule over the entire region of the old city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. They really do. They do. Wow. Well, it only stands to reason then why when we were at the Temple Institute and the uh, one of the rabbis there says says to, to us there that uh, Israel does not have control of Jerusalem. No. And he, did, he didn't limit it to just... You know, and, and I questioned him on that. I said, what do you mean? I said, I said if they don't, then who does? And then uh, my wife asked him this, asked, asked this question as well, because they were talking about building a temple, but not on the Temple Mount. But they, were, they, had, they had literally built, and they showed footage of it, a, a, a semi-tent, semi-temple outside of Israel, outside of Jerusalem, excuse me, outside of Jerusalem, that they were using right now. And he said that... Um, he said, we're going to build the third temple. And we asked him when. He says, well, when all the nations are agreeable to it, then we will build it. I said, well, and I asked him, what do you mean with all, when all nations are agreeable to this? He said, you know, he said, even the Palestinians have to be agreeable. I said, the Palestinians have to be agreeable to build the third temple. He said, yes. And then he mentions how the Bible said that all nations would flow into it. So I realized then that Rome is working with them. This is where they get all their financial backing. This is why they got all the temple treasures. This is why they've got a menorah laden with gold and everything else. It's because they're working with the Vatican. But yet you take someone like Gershon Solomon, who's a humble man of God. I mean, I used to be his neighbor. I lived right across the street from Gershon in Israel back in 2004. We became very good friends. And Gershon has always been for the building of the third temple, but he's been suppressed. And there's something I could tell you about what's going on inside of his organization that would spin your mind, but I, I won't say it here, but it would spin your mind. Can I share something here? Sure. And I know uh, most pe well, people watching this video won't know that me and Stephen have talked about mystery a lot in private. Uh, but I like to bring this in the video. Is that if you look at mercenary, I'm not talking about the knighthoods or the degrees, but the actual teaching of masonry. They predominantly talk about the building of Solomon's Temple. Agree? Yes. That's at the heart of Freemasonry. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's why I believe that this third Hebrew temple, although it will be for Orthodox Judaism, and Stephen, if you disagree with me, my brother... Man, if you disagree with me, that's fine. But I believe that a lot of the chief rabbis are high priests. I agree with that. I, you I'm know sorry. how you know how I know this, brother. There's there's no doubt. I, like I said, I look at Gershon Solomon, and Gershon it troubles him because I'm not you know I don't practice Judaism. It really, in fact, when I was there this last time, it really it it troubled him to his core because he yeah. really loves the Lord. But he won't go. He won't join in with all these groups. He just won't do it. And he and he and he told me. He says, "Look." He said, "God called me to do what I'm doing." He says, "I'm gonna." He says, "And I'll do what I'm doing until I die." And but I agree that there is a lot of rabbis that are Freemasons. They have to be, and I'll tell you why. Because it is clear. Now, when I say this, let me say. Let me make one thing clear. I don't believe, and I know that you don't believe in the Kazarian theory either. But what has happened, though, is just like with Shimon Perez or, or any of the others, what have they done? They, are they Jewish? Well, they may very well be Jewish by birth. But there's always been, there, we had Korah and Dathan and all that back during the time of Moses, men that, 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 that stood up against Moses and Aaron and, and always fought the work of God. In fact, God had to kill off the entire generation because of the wickedness. So how can we think that Israel would return to their homeland and not have the same problem? And when I sit there and I've showed video after video of, of, of head rabbis and stuff like that, and they're sitting having coffee with the Pope. You don't go to have coffee with the Pope of Rome unless you're part of some kind of clan to begin with because you're not going to get that invitation. 
Well, this is getting to the real heart of the conspiracy, the real core of the conspiracy, to people watching the video, from what I believe, is that the Black Pope, the Jesuit superior general, he controls Israel, always has. He used the British crown, well, not Pope Francis, but, you know, the Black Pops in history. They used the British crown to open up Israel. And obviously, through the Balfour Agreement, we also had the Rothschilds, and they were instrumental in building settlements. But more importantly, we have the State of Israel in 1948, and from that very... See, people have to understand this. From that very foundation, it was the Vatican that created Israel. It was yes. the Vatican, Stephen. Yes, it was. It was the Vatican. Yes, it was the Vatican. And that's why every single uh, leader of the Israeli government has been, I'm going to say it, Jesuit trend, Knights of Malta, or High Masons. Mossad was trained by American CIA, before that OSS, uh, British SIS. What you have here is you have this, you have... Now, Stephen, I need to explain this because I know you'll agree. If I explain this, I think you will agree. I hope you do agree. <laughs> even though, even though God prophesied that Israel would be gathered back to the land, even though God, through the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and Amos and all of the minor prophets, even though God prophesied that Israel would be gathered back to the land. Yet God himself, now this is a very deep mystery, brother. God himself has done it through Gentile, wicked men. I agree 100% on that. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. God has used the Illuminati. Now, this will shock people to the core. I'm telling you now, people that watch my videos and people that watch this video, they'll be shocked. God has used the Jesuits. God has used the Illuminati. God has used them. It doesn't mean that they're doing the will of God. What I'm trying to explain is this. God has used the Vatican to bring Israel back to the land. Does that shock you? No. Right. It's not the Rothschilds that brought them back. They are mainly knights of Malta. They're knights of the British crown. They have no power. They have some power, but they don't go high enough in the power structure. At the very top, you have the Black Pope. Now, the Jesuits understand Bible prophecy. But one thing they do not realize is this. Even though they brought the Jewish people back to the land of Israel, to rule over them, to dominate them, to oppress them, and that's the truth. The Jesuit order brought the people of Israel back. Now, this is, I'm sorry, but Stephen, I didn't plan on saying this. This is going to be a very heavy video. This it's okay. It's okay. The Jesuit order, the Jesuit order brought the people of Israel back to the land through Jesuit trained Adolf Hitler, back to the land after the Holocaust, Jesuit Inquisition, Jesuit Holocaust. They brought them back to that land in order to be established. The purpose was, and their purpose is, to annihilate them through Islam. Bear with me, Stephen. I'm, I won't be long. Go ahead. To annihilate them through Islam and Russia. Communism and Islam tied together against Israel to destroy Israel. But even though they planned this, the one thing they have not realized is that Jesus Christ will come. He'll come. At that very moment, Stephen, when they plan to destroy Israel through Russia and the Islamic nations, Jesus Christ will come on his white horse and he will destroy the papacy. He will destroy the Islamic Gog and Magog alliance against Israel. He will destroy them all. All of them. I'm talking about millions. Zechariah chapter 14 describes exactly what will happen. 
their eyes will rot in the sockets, the tongue will dissolve in the mouth. Millions upon millions. Absolutely. You know, Brother Alan, I cannot agree more. In fact, one of the things that I've, I've said in the past to many people, I've not gone into it like you have and connected it the way you've done here, but one thing I've always explained to people when we look at, uh, because I deal with the questions, people will say, well, you know, the Rothschilds built uh, Israel, and uh, or the Illuminati, or, or, or whatever the case may be. I knew, under a couple of different reasons, for a fact that the Vatican was involved in it. Because uh, I had proof of that personally. And I'll tell you that in just a moment. Uh, you already know it, but we'll tell it for the viewers here. But one of the other things that I also knew is that just as it was in the days of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, God had, not only did God come and curse Pharaoh and plagued Pharaoh and plagued his people, but he made Pharaoh force Israel out of Egypt to do what? To go to the homeland. And not only did he force them, not only did God use Pharaoh, because see the thing is, here's what's interesting if you think about it. Israel, even in Egypt, although they were slaves, they weren't slaves to start with. God had to put them in bondage. He had to allow them to go into bondage because why? Life had became easy in Egypt because originally Joseph, when they came, Joseph was basically the king over Egypt. He was the prime minister, you might say. And so therefore, life was good for them. They had the best of the land. They were given the best of everything. And so everything was going really great for many, many years. About 200 years, Israel had it really nice in that area. And at that point, God knew that they were never going back to the promised land on their own. It's kind of like the Jews when they were in Europe, in Germany, they had become very well off. Many of them, not all Jews were rich, uh, but many of them had become very well off. And so the same thing God had to deal with in, in raising up Hitler, even though the Illuminati did it, the, the Jesuits did it, but at the same token, it happened the same way in, in Egypt. God had to cause Israel to go into bondage, suffer under slavery, to where they would want to go, but then he had to cause the ruler of that land, after judging him so severely, to literally chase them out of the land. And that's what happened with Israel. They were, but here's what's interesting. This is how you know the Vatican's involvement. When the Jews began to try to come to Israel after the end of the Second World War, this is when the troubles happened. Because what happened? They, the, 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 the British were over. There was a British mandate. And there was only so many Jews allowed to migrate at a time. And they did this intentionally. This was because Rome already had planned that they wanted certain families in power. They wanted certain Jesuit trained, like Shimon Perez's family, who had already been trained in a Jesuit college in Poland. And that's, that's documented. That's not like it's not documented. That was written by Yitzhak Rabin's, uh, uh, in, in the autobiography about Yitzhak Rabin, they mention him that he went to a Jesuit, Jesuit college. That's something I, I, I know. Um, oh, gosh. Barry Hamish really well. Uh, me and Barry have known each other for a long time. So. Yes. And uh, yeah, most people call him Chamish, but his name is actually Hamish. I actually watched your video when you interviewed him. It was a good video. Yes, yes. Barry, Barry he can be very boisterous at times, but, but you just have to know what know his nature. But 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 any at any rate, um, what what were what were they doing? They were, they were intended to get certain people in there because they knew they were going to create the state. Brit, of course, that's why Britain was in there. They knew that they were going to do this. And so because, and I, and I won't call it on video the name, I, I, I'm very close friends with one of the leading families that were there that had had a major part in the Holocaust as, as, as a leading general, or, or not a general, but as far as in combating the Germans and rescuing Jews. And they specifically came to him right before the 48 War of Independence and asked him if, uh, if he would join with them. And part of, seeing they brought him into the inner circle, they let him know that when we go to take, when we go to fight this War of Independence, we have to take control of Jerusalem. It is imperative that we take control. And, and they, so they give him charge over the main road leading towards Jerusalem. And they said to him, you do not let anyone come past it. It doesn't matter if they're Jew or not, you kill them. If they try to pass, 
you and your men will kill them. And he refused to be a part of it. He says, you got to be kidding me. He said, I just spent the last six years of my life rescuing as many Jews as I possibly could in the Holocaust. And now you're telling me I've got to kill my own people? He said, I'll be no part of it. And God bless the man for not being a part of it. But he refused to be a part of it. But then I knew firsthand that it was Rome that was calling the shots here, as we see later. And it's obvious, too, because in 1993, what, what does uh, Shimon Perez do? Like Ahab's son, he sells us out. He marries Jezebel, brings that prostitute harlot down into Israel. They build all these altars unto Baal. And really and truly, this is what the two witnesses will do, Brother Alan, when they come. Not only are they going to bring judgment, but they're going to tear down those altars to Baal that are all over Israel. This is what they should be doing right now. And that country, and God right. would have more honor to that. All right, well, Stephen, I totally agree with you, but I need to talk about something, and I hope you'll talk about this with me, is the Black Pope. Yes. The Black Pope. Yes. Now, let me explain something, because I think that will lay a foundation for what we need to speak about. And we have to speak about this, Stephen, is the Black Pope. Now, what I have to explain to people that are watching this video that are not familiar with this is simply this. The Jesuit general always had control of the Vatican. He always had control of the White Papacy. They were suppressed by Pope Clement in 1773, and they were reinstituted by Pope Pius. Now, the Jesuit order... The black pope, he is the general of the Jesuit order. He's always had control over the papacy, always. Over every pope, bishop, cardinal. And what we have today is we have a Jesuit general. I do believe that Pope Francis is the Jesuit superior general. He is the black pope. I believe that. Amen. I really do believe that. And the reason why I believe that is, uh, I think it would take too long to go through it, but Hans Kohlbach resigned, and he positioned uh, Adolfo Nicholas Patchen in 2008, and then Pope Benedict resigned, <laughs> and then you had Pope Francis positioned. So you have a black Pope resign, you have a white Pope resign, and you have Pope Francis positioned. But anyway, people can speculate on that. My point is this. The black pope, the Jesuit general, has always been hidden. He's always been in the shadows, controlling the international and challenges community, the banking system, the world government, the Vatican. And he's always been hidden, Stephen, always. Yes. In the sense that the world has never known that he's covertly been secretly controlling the world government. In that sense. But in this generation, Pope Francis is coming forth, I do believe, I do believe, as the black pope. But he's coming forth, Stephen, as the white pope. You know? The Jesuit general, the black pope, is coming forth out in the open now, overtly, overtly, as the white pope. So that when war leaders like Obama, Joe Biden, etc. When they come to Pope Francis, they're bowing before, not the Pope, they're bowing before the Jesuit general. And that has never happened, Stephen, in history. Never in history have we ever had a black Pope that has ever been positioned as the white Pope. Now, you don't have to agree with me, brother. You could disagree. No, but I agree with that. I agree with that. That's the revelation I have. <laughs> and, and that's interesting when you think about it, that the one man that actually controls the world, that they are bowing to him now. It's interesting that you bring it out, too, that he, now he's, when he steps out in the open, he's, he's being the white pope. Uh, and, and, of course, we know that, of course, I won't get into the horse riders of Revelation, but, you know, there's one thing that's interesting. When, when Moses sings the song in Exodus 15, he says, Ashu'al Adonai Ga'al Go'o, I will get victory over the horse and over his rider. And he specifically sings things about one horse, one rider. And Revelation he, 6. 
Exactly. So what is he talking about? Because I believe that the, the rider in Revelations there on the, on, on the four horses is the same rider. He just changes horses. Yes. That's the, only, that's the only difference. And Moses comes to deal with one horse, one rider, not the 600 that just drowned in the, in the, in the sea. And of course, even, even, the, even the sages point out that he says, Asherah, which is the Aleph in front of the Sheen, which makes it a future tense. It's a song being sung in the future. It's a song of redemption. He's singing of redemption. And then look corresponding with that in Revelation 15. When there's this group that comes out on the sea of glass mingled with fire, and they, the Bible says they sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. But what's odd, though, is Moses is not there. Why? Well, he's one of the witnesses. He's killed. Amen. And they're coming out on the sea of glass mingled with fire, which is what? It's their final exodus. And what are they doing? They're going through the judgments of God. This is, their, this is that ascension. This is the, the resurrection. When the judgment is falling, final that final judgment is falling, then they're going up. And they sing the song of Moses, which means God has gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. Amen, Stephen. Amen. So, mm. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm looking for a scripture. You go, go ahead, brother. Well, well, oh, oh, I don't know. You put me on the spot here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, brother. I love listen, you, brother. Oh, praise listen, God. Listen, guys. Listen, guys. I watched the video. Everyone will know exactly where I stand. My revelation is this, and it's quite simple. It's not complicated. The Pope will be the Antichrist. Now, I will say this. It might not be Pope Francis. That's right. It might, it might not, not be Pope Francis. I'll say that right now. I don't want to go out there and record and say that Pope Francis done. It might not be Pope Francis. But I'll tell you what. It will be a Pope of Rome. And I'll tell you what. That Pope will be a black Pope. He'll be a Jesuit general. That's what I do believe. Amen. Because, because in history... The black popes, the Jesuit generals, they control the white popes. They control the popes of Rome. But anyway, I'll pass it on to Stephen. Amen. And let's see what Stephen has to say. You know, um, another one that goes with Zechariah 14 that you mentioned earlier, Zechariah 12, 2, where okay. God says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people around about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So again, we see that Israel is under a siege. That, that shows that they've not done too well in the battle. And that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people that burden themselves with it, and shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So again, it's alluding to Zechariah 14, that Israel does come under a siege. They are there. There's several scriptures clearly that shows. Because see, we're, we're normally we're used to thinking that God comes, He delivers Israel, and and the day is all finished, and everybody goes home all happy and merry. And He does deliver Israel. But there's also another scripture, and I can't think of where it's at right offhand, where God says that every man has his hands on his hips as a woman that is in travail. Can a man be in travail? Said, but he is because of why. Israel is in anguish. You know, one, God has got to bring Israel back to where Israel sinned. Israel sinned when? Israel sinned when they re rejected Samuel the prophet. They wanted to have a king over them. And, and God was not pleased with that. And God told Samuel, he said, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. You know, and he says, go tell them what they'll get when they get a king. And, 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 of course, he gives them a couple of good kings, but then they get a bad one that ends up causing them to go into exile. You know, but the point is, is Israel's going back the way she fell. I, I remember, Brother Alan, I told this to a Jewish lady years and years ago. I, I, I seen her, her children were in an elevator one time in, in Destin, Florida, and I, I happened to be doing a delivery down there, and I understood what they were saying. They were speaking in Hebrew, and it's kind of odd in that part of the country. And so I asked them, is your parents here? And they said, yes. Well, their, their father was sleeping, but their mother come down to meet me. And, and we spoke for a little bit. And I didn't share with her about the Lord Jesus because I knew in my heart she wasn't ready. But I, Benjamin Netanyahu had just been elected prime minister the first time. I said, isn't it interesting 
how that our people ran through the street crying out, Benny, King of the Jews, BB, King, you know, Benny, King of the Jews. And literally, that means my son, my son, King of the Jews. And, uh, and she said, yes, wasn't, is, wasn't it wonderful? And I said, it's wonderful. I said, but it, he'll never work. She said, what do you mean he'll never work? I said, sister, listen to me. I said, we failed God when we wanted a king. I said, and we asked for Samuel the prophet, or we told Samuel we wanted a king. God gave us a king. I said, but finally, our people in 70 AD went into captivity, so our king didn't deliver us in the battles, did he? I said, and then what has happened? I said, now, as history's come around, we've returned home. I said, and we're, we're wanting a king again. I said, and God is going to give us a king. I said, I, said, that's what we, I said, that's what we got now. Benjamin Netanyahu, I said, he is our king. I said, but he's got to fail because the other kings failed as well. Why? I said, now we'll cry out. I said, do you not open the door for Elijah for every Seder? She said, yes. I says, when the king fails, you'll cry out for Elijah. I said, God will send him. I said, and then when he sends him, then he'll tell you the way it should be. Then Messiah will come. And she said, I never thought about it like that before. I said, that's what God will do. I said, the way we left God is the way we have to go back to God. I said, and that's the way of our repentance must be. So, anyway, brother, you got any other thoughts? No, I'll keep sharing, brother. Keep sharing. You're Amen. doing good. Amen. Uh, you know, there's one scripture too, and I was hoping I would find this. And that was where it talks about uh, the treasure, you know, that, that he controls the treasure, the, the storehouses of gold and silver, which is clearly Rome as well. And anybody that's listening, especially if this is for the first time, Brother Allen, Obadiah, if they really want to know who wrote, that, that Rome is the Antichrist as well, Obadiah is one of the clearest scriptures for that. And if you go to verse 10, he says, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. And the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. So God is accusing this particular person, and he's calling it Edom, or Esau here. He said it's Edom. Yeah, well, he does call it Edom. In verse 8, he calls it uh, Mount of Esau. Uh, and he accuses Esau of coming in and being one with the forces that came into Jerusalem. Now, he's talking about the time when they came and they ransacked Israel in 70 AD. Now, watch what he says, though. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people, and shouldst not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. That's the temple treasures. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those that did uh, remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. So now he jumps into the future. But by the way, just so people know this, the Ark of Titus in Rome shows that the temple treasures went to Rome. God said Esau was the one that did it because God always had a judgment against Esau to begin with. He rose up against his brother Jacob. And that's exactly what, and, and we know the prince that shall come would be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which is Rome. So therefore, it's clearly it's got to be the Pope of Rome. And I want to ask you in a minute, because I want you to talk about the false prophet. A lot of people get this get a thought in their head about that, so I want you to bring that out in a minute. For the, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thy, their own, thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, they did their communion service on Mount Zion last year, so God is now identifying that they've drank on his holy mountain, and it was Rome. It wasn't, it wasn't some Muslim Mahdi. It wasn't some uh, caliphate over there doing that. He says, uh, uh, So shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion 
shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. That's why I believe that they're going to actually bring the temple treasures back to Israel as part of this thing to get the Jews in a, in a revival. Is because the Vatican, I believe, will re release the temple treasures to be in the building of the third temple. Because of that scripture. I could be wrong, but it's just a thought. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire in the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble and they shall kindle in them and devour them and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau for the Lord hath spoken it. Notice both the houses, the house of Judah and the house of uh, Israel are going to be home at that time. But here's what's interesting. Go down to verse 21. It says, and the saviors, actually in the Hebrew language, it says anointed ones. Okay. And the anointed ones shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's the two witnesses. And in Hebrew, it, it is in the plural. Moshe Chinim. Messiahs. Or in the way we would translate it in English, anointed ones. You know, in fact, when people use the scripture for the anointed ones over, I believe, what is that, in Zechariah, that scripture doesn't actually use the word anointed ones technically in Hebrew. It's a good translation, but it's not really what it says. That is the only scripture in the Bible where it speaks of anointed ones in a plural. I am not disputing that, but I need to share something. Is that okay, Steve? Sure, go right ahead. I am not disputing anything you've said. <laughs> <laughs> so that's truly, brother. Okay, go ahead. I'm ready. Truly, truly, I'll say this before I begin. I love you, man. I love Amen. you. But I want to say something. I want to say something, brother Stephen. Is that okay? I want to go back to uh, the foundation of the Jesuit order. I'm Ignatius of Loyola, and their agenda to infiltrate every Protestant denomination. Okay? Okay. I want to talk about that. And their agenda is to be a Protestant amongst Protestants, to be a Calvinist amongst Calvinists. They will be, they will really wear any mask that they have to wear. And you find with the Jesuit order that they can infiltrate Islam, <laughs> truthfully, they can infiltrate uh, Charismatics, Pentecostals. They yes. can infiltrate Methodists. They can infiltrate anything. Mormons, you know, oh, come on, you know. The Jesuits created the Mormon religion through Russell. They created the Mormon yes. religion. They, no, it's the truth. I know they it created, is. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. They're all high masons. All of these uh, leaders of these uh, cults, they're all high Freemasons. They're all, you know, 33rd, you know, degree Freemasons. That's all how come the they're not prosecuted for all the child molestation in all these organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Continue they're all on. Like yes. Yeah. They're all 33rd Templars. Luciferians, that's why. And uh, what I was going to say was the Black Pope. Okay. The Superior Jesuit General, I've said this before, I think, I think I've said it a few times on this video with you, Stephen, but I'll say it again. The Superior Jesuit General, he's always controlled the governments of the world secretly, covertly, in the shadows. It's only in this generation that he's come forth in the open through Pope Francis. And the reason why that is, is because they have their politicians positioned all over the earth, you know, as in Jesuit controlled alumni politicians that come from Jesuit universities. I don't have to take a long time to explain this, I'll just get to the point. You have a world government today that is controlled by Jesuit politicians that graduate from Jesuit universities, and that is something that can be proven if you'll just do your research. But Pope Francis has come forth only 
as a Jesuit provincial, but he's not just a Jesuit provincial. He's not. Stephen, I've watched videos of the Jesuit Curia. I've watched videos of Pope Francis in the Church of the Jesuit. And I'll tell you what, Adolfo Nicholas Patchen, Stephen, he's dressed as an ordinary provincial, not a Jesuit general. And he stands there in subordination to Pope Francis. He's clearly in, in subordination. Now, the point is this, and I'll finish with this, is that for the first time in the history of the sight of Jesus, for the first time in the history of the Jesuit order, we actually have a Jesuit general who has become the white pope. He's become the Pope of Rome. Why would they do that, Stephen? I'll tell you why. I'll finish with this. They've always controlled the monarchies. They've always controlled the presidents covertly, in the shadows, secretly. But it's obvious that at some point in the future they were going to come forth in the open. It's obvious. And they've done that through Pope Francis. He is, in fact, the Jesuit general. He is the most powerful man on the earth, and he does, in fact, control Scottish Rite Freemasonry. He controls Satanism. That's the truth. He controls witchcraft. He controls, uh, my God, the Illuminati. He controls the New World Order. He controls everything. Pope Francis is the leader of the world government. But he appears as the white Pope. In that sense, he appears as the Pope of Rome. So the masses, the millions won't see that. They have no revelation, Stephen, that he is in fact the Jesuit general. And the Jesuit general secretly controls the governments of the world. He controls Satanism. He controls Freemasonry. He controls the Illuminati. That's it. I agree with that completely. And, and, and I want to ask you this, Brother Alan, because I get asked this a lot. I haven't, I, I've probably addressed it on older videos. And in fact, I know I have, but I haven't addressed it here in, in quite a while. But so many people, because I say that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist, um, and, and like yourself, I've always taught as well, in fact, my wife was the first one that got the revelation on this in our own family. Was that uh, we were looking? At, we were looking at you know there there you know there's many antichrist uh, already in the in the world, and and there was there was a different scripture, but she said that's the papal dynasty. She said the antichrist are the. In other words, all the antichrist that you see in the scripture would always be a papal dynasty, and in the that's early right, days. Before, when, when, when John was dealing with it, because he said that spirit was already alive and well then, those were the seeds of the Vatican. Those were the ones that became the early church fathers uh, that gave birth to the Vatican, etc. Uh, you know, so, but in, in light of this, though, people say, okay, we believe that the Pope of Rome is the false prophet. So if the Pope of the Rome is the Antichrist, then who's the false prophet? That's yeah, always their yeah, yeah. question. You know, I mean, I personally believe it's like one and the same. I mean, that's been my take on it, oh, but I may not no, be Stephen, right on that. Stephen, 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 sorry. I'm not one to interrupt people, but I've got to interrupt you here. That's okay, go ahead. No, I've got to, Stephen. <laughs> sorry, I feel compelled to. I'm not absolute on my thought. It's just a thought. No, so no, go ahead. Stephen, I've got to, because... When you read Revelation chapter 13, it talks about the Antichrist, sorry, the beast that rises that two horns like a lamb, yes. speaks as a dragon. Yeah. If you go on Google or, uh, you know, YouTube, and you type in Pope Francis, I'll tell you what, you'll be surprised. Every page come, comes up, Francis the false prophet, Pope Francis the false prophet, Pope Francis the false prophet, all the way down, page after page after page. Why is that? Well, no, no, I'm with you. I'm going go to ahead, go you. ahead. I'm going to answer you, right? Yes. It's because the Vatican does not want people exposing the Pope as the Antichrist. 
Well, that I know is obvious. I know that that that, that he is that that is a decoy. But there again, you know, there was one one yeah, yeah, yeah. one brother that 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 I've met. He was he was he's a, the way he always put it was if you look at the scripture, the false prophet. John writes about the false prophet in the uh, in in the book of uh, in in his book, the book of John. He says, but when you go to Revelation, you don't see the word false prophet anymore. You just see Antichrist. And he felt, you know, he said the way he put it, he always thought that it was the fact that he goes from false prophet to being the Antichrist, or he's just referred to. He gets a greater revelation of who he really is. But, you know, and that sounds more logical, but of course everybody tries to say, well, the false prophet and the Antichrist are both thrown into the lake of fire. Hey, Stephen, let's stop there. What do you believe? I, here's the thing for me, brother. Talk to the people in the video about what you really believe. What do you believe? Okay. To me, what, what Satan is doing, Satan wants to have, as we see in God, God... We, we know that there's God, there's a Father, an almighty, invisible God that cannot be seen. We know that Jesus Christ, Yeshua himself, is birthed from God. He comes from the very inside of God. He is brought into this world, manifested. I believe that he's been here from the very day that he spoke the light into existence, all the way down through until he came into a human body. You know, and, and became the, the savior of the world. I believe that. All right. I believe that in him was the Holy Spirit and he poured that Holy Spirit out upon us so that we could have that one life with him and be one with him. Okay. Now, I think that Satan has the same desire. Satan is the man in the background and he's giving life or his death, in other words, to the Pope of Rome himself. He's causing him to be that Christ-like, because really Antichristo is a pseudo-Christ. He's making him look like he's the Messiah. But he's he's governed by that by Satan himself. So in that case as well, why can't that still be the false prophet through the same man? Now that's a that's a thought. There, there again, it's a conjecture, because for me, I deal more in Old Testament or the Tanakh for the Jewish people I, do, I take more from there and we don't have Steve, that in the Steve, Tanakh Steve, Steve, what do you mean Antichrist and false prophet combined what do you mean ok ok you know, can, I, can I admit something and I want to admit something to everybody on YouTube and they can hear me on Steve Bandana's channel <laughs> I have no idea who the false prophet is <laughs> <laughs> have you any idea Stephen you know, looking you know, when I look at the beast, one thing I think about the beast, though, okay. I think okay. of that more as the power that the Antichrist governs. When you think of a beast, because a beast is a beast is a beast of burden. You know, right. a beast is a power. A beast represents strength. You know, so yeah. could the beast then represent powers that he has control over? Uh, well, one, one one thing we do know, Stephen, is that we're not just talking about a deception. We're talking about actual power demon power yes the false prophet calls them fire from heaven this is real all right now see that's where when i've sat there and i have read because and you know yourself i've had in my possession the the highest order of masonry what their secrets are yes. they're studying yes. they want to know what the mysteries are that were known in egypt i know that for a fact and Masons out there that do that listen to this video, they ain't gonna like to know that. But I have read what you know, I know what you know, and Stephen, I know that they're looking Stephen, for that. Don't share too much. Okay. The one thing I will say on this video is Stephen knows and he shared with me that revelation of masonry, and this man knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but anyway, when it comes to that and having that knowledge at hand, Rome has sent their scholars to study. Now that I see because I, I've watched what we see in documentaries. There are, do, there are documentaries that are out there to the public right now that if you knew what we know about masonry and what their, what their intentions are to discover the secrets of Egypt, 
Because they want, they want the, and, and this is the way it's put, the magical powers that the, that the priest knew in Egypt. They want to know that. Why else would they want to know that? They've got to deal with two witnesses. Just like Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh of Rome, Pharaoh was the Antichrist of his day. And they've got to deal with that. They've got to deal with those two when they come. When Moses and Elijah return, they got to deal with that. Stephen, Stephen, listen. Okay. Let's go back to the let's go back to the Black Pope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's go back to the Black Papacy. Okay. The Black Pope, right, has controlled the Vatican. He's controlled the cardinals, the bishops for hundreds of years. It's they have remained hidden. They have remained in the shadows, hidden covertly. But in this generation, in this generation, they brought forth Pope Francis Bagaglio to be their Pope of Rome. Now, what that is, it's actually the Jesuits coming out in the open because they know that they have the whole world deceived and they have the Christian church dumbed down. So when you have Pope Francis positioned, what you actually have is a Jesuit general, a black pope, and I do believe this, Stephen, you have a black pope, a Jesuit general, positioned as the black pope. For the first time in history, as the white pope. It's very powerful, Stephen. And you know what that means? It means that the new world order begins now. It begins right now. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. A lot of things are happening, Brother Allen. There's one thing I've noticed. Prophecy is being fulfilled before people realize it. When I read to you moments ago about where God says, they have drank on my holy mountain from Obadiah. That was a prophecy clearly about Rome that they would do a what they call a communion service at, at Mount, on Mount Zion. And they did it. And they did it in the very place that they were never allowed to do it. They wanted to do it where it would be considered Jesus' last supper. They wanted to do it there on King David's tomb to show that they have authority over Israel. The thing is this. <laughs> to be in politics at the highest level, in some way you've got to be Masonic, you've got to be Vatican Knighthood, you've got to be connected to the Vatican at some level. But the thing is this, at the same time, God knows the hearts. He knows the hearts, you know? One thing I do know in Zechariah chapter 14, and this is what I want to share about Israel, is that God is going to raise up the government of Israel. Yes, he According is. to Zechariah 14, Stephen. And they're going to fight against the Vatican. They're going to fight against Russia. They're going to fight against the Islamic nations. They're going to fight against the New World Order. They really are. That's Micah chapter 4 and verse 10 where he tells them, this, after they go through all the, all the struggles, after they go through all the trembling, then he says, they don't know what my thoughts are. And then God commands Israel to stand up and to fight. And they will fight. The people of Israel, at the end of the Great Tribulation, they will fight against the New World Order. But it won't be much of a fight because Israel won't do any fighting. The Lord himself will destroy yes, millions yeah. upon millions and he will destroy them with a plague. Their eye sockets will dissolve in their mouth and in their mouth they will dissolve, you know. The Spirit of the Lord will send out a plague and they will be dissolved. I mean, millions upon millions of them. <laughs> it's shocking, really. But Jesus Christ, when he comes to Israel in the Mount of Olives, he will destroy millions upon millions that are gathered against Israel, and he will be the refuge of his people. Amen. But I want to say this as well as a close, as well in this video, is that the Israeli government will be an Israeli government that will be raised up from Judea. They will be raised up from Joseph. Amen. They'll be raised up from the people of Israel. 
you will not have this Romanish, popish, corrupt government that you have today. You won't oh, have that, Stephen. That's right. But you will have men of God that will rise up and they will fight. People say, oh, you know, you we should. No, 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 listen. They will fight. They will fight again. That be Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I agree. Hallelujah. Amen. I know people. Stephen, people don't like to hear this kind of message. <laughs> no, they don't. Because we, those that even support Israel, we, we you know, myself, I mean, I'm Jewish. Uh, you know, it's hard because you know that God is going to deliver us. And that's what we're pointing out at the very end of this as well. He is going to deliver our people. But he's also, just like it was during the wilderness journey, he's got to, he's got to wipe out all this group, you know, that's that's the evil wicked group Moses came out and he had a whole bunch of them that was no good and God destroyed them and that's what's going to happen again